So as I started to think about this and how we could, I could talk about it and frame it and kind of make it interesting, because the narrative of the maritime transit system that includes our inland waterways, ports, etc., is sort of one of political neglect, right, and lack of capacity. Like that's overwhelmingly is the area that apps are going to work in. So I was trying to, the lecture is basically designed to give you some background of those things, kind of who regulates it, what's important, what some of the main issues are, etc. So I was trying to think of how do you start this? Like what really summarizes that? What gets us to the, uh, here's a weird echo for this. What gets us to the heart of that question? And I think I found it. Some of the man-made, some of the not, right? 
are, are of all varying degrees of the varying depths, and widths, etc., which means that a lot of the infrastructure that goes into building these things is spent, the time and money is spent widening them, deepening them, establishing locks. Anybody know what a lock is? Not the Scottish Lake, but yeah, in the front. Yeah, it raises or lowers the level of the water. Exactly. <laughs> Kind of ferry the you ferry the barges and ships and other things like that into a canal, and the lock raises and lowers the level so they can move on to the next area of the of the, of the waterway. I think it's pretty cool. And I thought it was a little bit. A canal connects two bodies of water that may have different water levels. That's incredible. Ships traveling through the canal move from one water level to another through a lock, a rectangular chamber with watertight gates at each end. In the lock. The level of water can be raised and lowered by a system of valves and water passages. Suppose a ship is traveling from the higher water level to the lower. First, an operator at a nearby station opens the lock gates at the high end. The ship enters the lock and the lock gates are closed. Next, the lock operator opens one or more valves so that water from the lock slowly drains into the lower section of the canal. When the water in the lock is level with the lower water, the operator opens the gates and the ship sails through. To move a ship upstream, the procedure is reversed. All right, that's pretty cool. But I thought this was particularly interesting. This is time lapse photography at the Panama now. The lock system actually works. Uh, it takes a long time for the water to raise and lower, so time lapse is pretty neat. It's actually a living minute video. We're not going to talk about it for very long. I will say a couple things about it, is, right? I thought it was cool. We did that. We covered this time lapse. Uh, these ships that are going through, and I'll talk more about them later, the size of these ships actually kind of matter. They're called post panamaps, which is referring to the size of the ship and how wide and deep the lock has to be to get in. Post the update of the Panama Canal, uh, the depth of it is much deeper. At least a 50-foot canal has to, be uh, uh, has to be built. And I don't remember exactly what the width is, but we're dealing with sort of a new era of super ships. This is a cool example. They're basically giant floating mountains that go through up and down. So, What's that? No, there's a I still did not hear what you said. Never mind. Never mind, I heard that part. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> give you an idea of what travels on this. Roads, rails, bridges move a lot of people, and as Toby was talking about a second ago, there's a good debate about which one of those is more important to us. To give you an idea, I don't know if you can read all these things. What do you think the primary things that are sent are? Petroleum, coal, sand, gravel, and stone, food farm products, crude petroleum, and chemical related products, and we get down here to those things, sulfur, waste, whole coke, etc., etc., etc. It gives you a sense, I think, though, of the relative importance of the waterways. What's going, what's being moved primarily across them? Fuel, energy, absolutely and vitally important to our energy infrastructure is that uh, is our, our, our inland waterways and the assurance that they are going to continue to be effective expedient means of transporting these particular goods. Also on there, and this is pretty cool because there are lots of cards about this as you will probably eventually find, food and farm products. Two elements of that that are probably important. Why does it matter? I guess. Agriculture still makes up a huge section of our economy overall and the ability to trade those products with other countries is huge. Also, there's excellent evidence, surprisingly, I was kind of shocked by this, but there's excellent evidence that talks about what happens if our inland waterways were so no longer effective we couldn't transport that stuff to ports. What do you think might happen? Where's a lot of our excess food go? We've got subsidized our, our agricultural market, we overproduce a certain amount of food. What do we do with that food? What? Yep, yeah, Senator Blair. Other countries, we send it to other countries, food exports, right, and food assistance and food aid. There's actually a really interesting and pretty good food aid advantage to cases that deal with uh, you know, modernizing and updating our right, water system. But you get a sense sort of, of what's going on there. Energy infrastructure, a lot of these things that are particularly important to our military, right, the internal the waterway transportation of fuels for military uses. Uh, in fact, we'll look at in a little bit of a bit of a report by the Army War College. They did about a 200-page report on the importance of inland waterways to U.S. hegemony. Uh, awesome, here in the mirror. and pretty interesting to read. Well, I did not read all 200 pages, but my browser did. So you may be thinking that sounds cool, right? Uh, other than puppets drowning in Panama Canal, we don't think too much about it. We saw the lock working. It looks like things are going pretty well. So really, what's the problem? Ah, well, we're back to that thing I talked about before, the idea of political neglect and incapacity. 
So check this out. The U.S. Army Corps, Corps of Engineers, the CRS, you might know what CRS is, Congressional Research Service, they have the chock full of stuff about roads, rails, and water events, decided in 2010 in a report that 47% of U.S. inland waterways are obsolete. That sounds crazy just on the boat school, right? Now, you do have to think about this for a second. And this is another really <coughs> stunning fact, I think, is that nearly 60% of inland waterway structures were built before 1930 in the year of 50 or so of our active locks built before 1830. Think about what ships look like in that video we just watched. They're going through the Panama Canal, giant floating cities, right? Big mountains and things. Now think about what a ship looked like in 1830. In 1830, you pull your ship up to a wooden dock and some folks help you physically unload the cargo, right? Now we talked a little bit about this before and we'll talk more about it again. But the idea of intermodality means you never actually touching the product or trying to create the ideas to move that all at one time so it can be more efficient. 1830s. Those are not particularly well updated. If you think about the other, it's 60% built before 1930. That's pretty, that's pretty nasty, right? Now let's put that in some sort of technological context. Maybe 1930 doesn't sound that bad. So let's watch some TV. In that kind of what it looked like. Anybody using one of those anymore? Yeah. I got one of my. <laughs> yeah, you play it. You play Xbox. It. Yeah, it's, it's HD here. All right, fine. We'll just take the car. Yeah, if I drive one of those, I'll just drive it. All right, here's a car here. This is my favorite. I'll just write all this down to my computer. <laughs> Obviously, we have updated it, right? But the idea is the technology we were using in the 1860s through 1930s primarily was when the establishment of these waterways happened, not particularly technologically advanced. None of us are going to use one of these anymore, right? In the same way that our inland waterways are not nearly as effective as they could, should, would be. So, yeah, just Some other things that weren't happening in 1930s at the there's no rights act, there's no last, well there was a law, there's no microwaves, like prohibition, fairly awesome, and uh, no All right, so the debate part of this for us probably deals a little bit, of, quite a bit in this area, the idea of how these inland waterways are regulated. And as I said, there's a lot of political neglect and uh, unhappiness about the potential of this. So if you figure, well, I'll get to the first. Until about 1824, when the federal government started regulating interstate commerce, the upkeep of inland waterways, ports, bays, all that kind of stuff, right? Entirely done by the states, which they largely did, They're funded through the commerce that came through. They didn't have a lot of federal help there at all. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers didn't take responsibility until quite a little bit later. Uh, after that, on, after 1824, the Commerce Clause, the U.S. Corps of Engineers takes control. And they're responsible for, uh, primarily responsible for maintenance. Although there's a couple pieces of legislation that changed. 1978, 1986, these are watershed years for <coughs> inland waterways. The two predominant pieces of legislation dealing with the regulation of them, how they're funded, how they're going to be maintained, who's responsible for that, all the things that matter to you as you're getting ready for this topic happened in these two years. Now I was making fun before that 1930 was the last, you know, the last time some of them were like massively upgraded. Uh, 1978, 1986, having legislation that far, 1991 is actually the last update of either of these two pieces of legislation I'll talk about in a second. It's still quite a ways, quite a ways out. So some of the systems we have in place currently for regulating, specifically for regulating how we pay for the maintenance and upkeep of our inland waterway systems are uh, woefully out of date. I'll give you an example. The Inland Waterways Revenue Act establishes the in Inland Waterways Trust Fund, the IWTS. Creates the user fuel taxes. So before that, there were, before this is 19, 1978 legislation. Before this, the user the states were still more the, the burden sharing of how to pay for upkeep of inland waterways, the locks, and all those sort of things was not well defined. And as a result, things kind of fell into some disarray. Now, once the user fuel tax was created, it kind of created a burden sharing situation where the federal government's responsible for so much of it and the taxes generated, taxes which go into the IWTF are responsible for funding some of the projects as well. 100% federal funding is what was established in 1978 for all inland, inland waterway maintenance. 
Now, check this out. About 85% of projects we do in this area are classified as maintenance, or over, not overhaul, not new construction, but maintenance, which means the federal government is bearing a huge proportion of that cost. Even though the Inland Waterway Trust Fund or the user fees, right, are generating some revenue, most of the projects fall outside of those categories. They're not being subsidized by those revenues necessarily. The other issue is that, well, the other way it breaks down the, the sharing of the 50% of federal funding for construction and major maintenance. So even when something reaches the threshold of major maintenance or new funding for new projects, the federal government still has to bear 50% of the overall cost of that. Now, in a fairly austere time, that is not where money is being appropriated, right? Also, in a fairly austere business environment, you can probably imagine the barge industry isn't real super excited about paying more for transiting through the, our inland waterway system, which is sort of the political neglect that I was talking about before. So, to give you an idea of what this thing currently costs, I'll give you a second piece of legislation. This is 1986, the Water Resource Development Act, the RDA. You'll see a lot about that as well as about this. It creates the current cost sharing arrangement for construction and overhaul. So now the federal government is tapping on the IWTF to actually start to pay for the project. Now here's part of the, part of the problem, is that the IWTF has not been adjusted for inflation since 1991. So people going through are not paying an adjusted amount commensurate with how much it is actually costing to have people prepared. This gives you an idea of what the taxes are. So they're paying a 0.04 cent tax in October 1980, and more recently it goes up to a 0.20 cent tax after 1994. That's the adjustment for it. Now, here's the problem. And this part will, I think, we'll be able to explain it. Federal spending on it, the tax revenues down here, right? and what the IWT, IWTF could possibly cover. As the tax revenues go down, the IWTF is not meeting, these costs, not meeting that need, right? And so the amount of money needed to invest in an aged inland waterway system that blocks the widening, of the, uh, the widening of the rivers and so on and so forth, the dredging, all those kind of things are woefully, woefully inaccurate, and, and, uh, are woefully underspent. We're underspending, is what I was trying to say. Now, can you guess why it's difficult to get this changed? Well, hey, it is broke, so we ought to fix it. What's next? Why don't people want to fix it? Yo. No one likes taxes. So, no one likes taxes. That's right. And freight doesn't vote. No, the, the cargo on the ship doesn't actually vote. It's actually a freight issue. Like, freight don't vote, so they don't care quite as much about it. Now, the barges and the barging lobbies, the people who use the inland waterway systems do, and they vote no, because they do not want to pay a higher fuel tax or levy a higher tax for the usage of our inland waterway system. By the way, what we're talking about here is our politics. Right? Anything you do, whether it's to fund the, I could, uh, short of just having the federal government fund the ever loving to Jesus out of the IWTF, the barging industry, particularly, the shipping industry, the different fingers, the freight industry, are going to be pretty much completely and utterly and totally. Mm -hmm. So you kind of see what's going on. The deficit is spinning. So, what does all this mean to the affirmative? Now, I, much like what Toby said, I'm not going to try and predict what every single half of the particular area or in the waterway is going to do. I think that more important for us is to think about why they are important. There's three main reasons, I think. The first is economic. 630 million tons shipped across the tax waterways, making about $73 billion a year. That's quite a, a high number, right? Lots of trade and activity going on. Lots of taxes being left as well. Which means that every time we do these products, it's, it's better for our trade, it's also better for our competitiveness. If we can't get product through our inland waterway system to port and export it to some other country, so export it to uh, uh, consumers elsewhere, then other countries are going to do that. And the image of the United States is strong and competitive, obviously, would be in the toilet. Resource diversions and navigation outages, as it says here drive up prices, drive down U.S. competitiveness, and crush consumer and business confidence overall. The cards on this are excellent and abundant, which means that prices for things like industrial products, sector-specific advantages would be big, agriculture, food security, I talked a little bit about that. Name three, 
He named three sectors that probably rely on, here are the products that are primarily shipped instead of a lot of energy. He named three sectors that probably rely on those things. It's a trick question because nearly every sector of our economy relies on the, the safe transit of those deals. And job growth, not only growth in the other sectors, but growth, but there's actually, there's decent cards, although not as good, I think, as like roads and uh, roads cards that talk about why these projects themselves build jobs and get more people employed and move around and so on and so forth. So you get the idea. Now, this is the money for me, the military. As I said, the Army War College produced a report that talked about the relative importance of our inland waterway systems. And so much like our highways are important for our, for our domestic security, so are our waterways. This card is pretty good on that front, but basically the breakdown of it is that we use our water systems because they are faster in some, time, in some ways than our, our road transit systems for military purposes. For, for movement of military and, uh, products and military needs. Steel is a big one. You saw all those fuels, etc. Et having a strong inland waterway system also there's good cards on the perception of US activity. We can't move our products effectively, we don't have a strong leader overall. So we're taking a look at this particular report. This is from the 2007, there's a 2011 updated as well, but I thought this card was pretty good. Which means for the military, there's resource management questions, how effectively they manage these resources to help fight wars, et cetera, et cetera. Anti-terror, obviously, and probably the biggest one is you know, internally to US security. Gotta have a military that is well supplied with the thing, the industrial products that it needs to be effective. If not, then probably we are not a very effective military. Again, cards on this are all pretty good. And of course, there's environmental impacts to it as well. What do you think one of the big drawbacks of using the roads to, tra to transport, environmentally, one of the big drawbacks of using roads to transport stuff. Yeah, it, it, roads cut through stuff, I think, you know, tunnel and so on and so forth, yeah. You have to actually take the roads, you don't have to do that. Rivers already built, you know. We do have to do things with rivers, we widen them, we deepen them, we have to build locks and those other water systems, but for the most part, they're there, we can take advantage of them, exactly true. Yeah. Yeah. It pollutes a lot. In fact, here's the number, remember, is it pollutes about 40% more. <laughs> and that pollution is calculated not just in the transit element of it, but the construction element of it as well. So it pollutes a lot, particularly CO2, air pollution. Light, by the way, not one that is commonly talked about, but there's excellent evidence about this in light. You see the difference? You don't have to light up a river, but you do have to light the river. Light pollution, especially in rural areas and different environments, I remember who said that, changes the way we are going to the sky, map that, like all sorts of astrological impacts. It's actually very interesting. And light pollution is one of the overlooked but really cool areas, I thought, of this uh, deep literature. There's also the construction cost. To build the, the river's already there, as somebody said. So while we do, we build up infrastructure around the river, road infrastructure, rail infrastructure, things like that require far more. Uh, to require far more construction costs. Now that does create more jobs, but then you've got, you're back to the debate about which, which is more important. Uh, people, people moving or freight moving, right? which is more important for our overall economy. And there's great arguments for both, but they're very, very strong for why it matters to our inland water resources. All right, so they matter. There's a huge amount of our trade. Competitive, competitiveness is an issue, and the overwhelming reason why we're not doing more is a, a sort of political malaise about increasing the taxes primarily going to fund it. Remember, the federal government is paying for an enormous amount of the day-to-day -day sort of stuff. And the big projects are split between them. The big projects are often hard to get approved and funding for because those lobbies know that the, in order for the project to be pulled off, they're going to require a huge amount of investment from them, which is primarily an excise taxes on the use of the water. Resources. So it's kind of a quick and dirty overview of the inland water. Oh, one more thing I want to talk about. I forgot about this. 40% less carbon intensity. I said that. Sure, why not? <laughs> so, sort of the other side of the coin here for our waterway systems are the ports. And I think the ports might be, in some ways, I don't know if more interesting. It's, there's more complex sets of regulations. Some of the bigger internal links come from our ports. I want to kind of break this down into two areas because I think that, and I'll, I'll talk more about this in just a moment, but I think that there's, when people started talking about ports in this topic, 
hear a lot of people talk about port security and how important it is to stop terrorism and dirty bombs coming in and so on and so forth. But uh, I'm not sure that's topical. We'll talk about why it's not in a second. But before we get there, let's kind of give a general breakdown of what the port system is like. We have about 300 ports in the United States uh, that are federally regulated. There are many more than 300 ports in the world, but they're managed by a law to us, government organization that highlighted some of the big ones here. The Maritime Administration, MARAD, is one of them. And MARAD, I should have mentioned this before, but MARAD actually is the overarching what, uh, a regulatory body for inland waterways and ports as well. FEMA is involved, obviously. What's FEMA do? Yeah, we're concerned about our ports, for example, being bombed or something like that. Even the emergency management uh, in of that. Our Coast Guard, obviously, they're primarily involved with the security infrastructure of the FBI as well. The Customs and Border Control, for sure, and the Department of Transportation. And the last one, which I should have highlighted, but didn't, but you should, because I told you, is local law enforcement authority. One of the interesting things about ports that you'll learn is that a lot of it is done locally through interstate compacts, things like ports really. In fact, while the ports are legislatively created, zoned legislatively essentially for TV ports, they're administered by local port authorities. You might want to guess what the largest port authority in the U.S. is. Who said LA? Wrong. Pass. Guess again. New York. New York, New York. New York. Port authority, the largest in the United States. And they're just primarily in charge of developing, managing, and promoting waterborne commerce. <laughs> The intent of, you know, obviously building a stronger. So that's kind of what they do. Legislatively created, but run locally, primarily. That's important. Really important. Uh, what we have here is a look at the, you see it very well, the map is turned up all that great. It's a map of where most of our ports are, a breakdown overall of how much the import and export. And again, you can kind of see, it's a little, actually, the ports over the waterways, the West Coast has a little bit more going on. Someone did say LA, the port of Los Angeles. But uh, the East Coast, again, the primary, and we <laughs> export imports there pretty much equal across the board in the United States. Except for on the West Coast, there seems to be a little bit more imports. Yeah. Yeah. Just a bit now, why does this matter for us as debaters or in a debate round? Because the connection, the empirical connection between GDP and trade is staggered. They illustrated here. As trade increases, so does your GDP. This is your competitiveness in the economy, right? This is a 2011 U.S. Department of Commerce and Department of Transportation study looking at the effects of it. And you can see that, that not only is there a correlation with food that spikes. So the more trade we're doing, the more effectively we're trading, the more effectively we can get boxes of freight from point A to point B on, off the railroad and onto the ship, et cetera, et cetera, the fewer people have to touch it. The more money we make, the raw, the stronger the U.S. economy is, and we're off to the races. Now, thinking about what the future of our ports look like, not so rosy. By 2020, every major U.S. container port is going to either double, or in some cases quadruple, the amount of trade coming through. Now, remember what I was saying about inland waterways and ports and moving stuff off boats, like all the way back 1930s, 1830s, 1860s, right? Our port systems suffer a lot of the same problems that are in the water system. They've, in some ways, have been more updated, but at the same time, not particularly. You're no longer just like sailing your ship up to the port and having a bunch of guys wheel some casks of something off your boat, right? Intermodality means that there's just giant containers that almost directly off of the rail system and then back and forth overall. U.S. ports transport about 90% of the physical goods that are traded in the United States, the United States 98%. They're coming from import or export, right? It's coming from the coast, and that's an enormous amount of our trade. It represents 25% of the U.S. trade overall. So almost every product that anybody uses, anything in this room you're wearing, touching, seeing today, most likely, 90% chance at some point, came in from the U.S. So, well. The problem for us, though, is that while we're not investing in our port infrastructure, other countries are. Most countries are leapfrogging us and investing in world-class ports. World-class ports means they're capable of, of taking on ship, uh, larger ships, which means 
for cargo, for cutting, for trade, etc. In fact, China folks crushing us in this. Crushing us. They're at $6.9 billion. The port of Shanghai has the largest port that has the largest container capacity of any place in the world. So not Los Angeles, not New York, etc. US is ranked 23rd. Overall, 23 overall. That's an average, right? 23 overall. Guess how many of the 10 largest ports in the world, right? How many of those were in the United States? One. One? Zero. 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 Guess how many are in China? Twelve of the top ten are in China. <laughs> we're going to go back. <laughs> ten. Five, nine. Pardon me. Nine. The Dutch have one. <laughs> Dutch are hanging out at number four. They're flower trees. Actually, they're one of the biggest imports in anyway, China crushing us. Nine of the top ten. How do you think that, what do you think that means to the United States in terms of trade competitiveness going this way? I think the tech, I'm not an expert, I'm just a debate coach, but I will use a technical term for it, and I think it's that we're job. Screwed. Sort of the technical term. Uh, yeah, they're way, 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 way ahead of us. Rank 23rd in the world port capacity, not so good. China's about to over, has already overtaken us compared to this dominant. Part of the problem in the U.S. and part of the reason why our inland waterway systems and port systems are so important is because we have so many other problems with our other transit systems. Our land side systems are congested for sure. They have all kinds of bottlenecks. This, the current flood level of congestion costs us about $200 billion a year. That number is only going to go up. 2.3 billion gallons of fuel are used, 3.7 billion hours each year. Slow freight, obviously, increases reliability, increased cost, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, all of this is interconnected. None of it works by itself, right? We need all these systems to work. But we can increase our competitiveness overall and definitely start to compete with China. And competing with China would be a little bit easier, obviously, because we're so far behind. Uh, anything we do is going to be a move in the right direction if we can kind of fix our port problems. It helps a lot. Part of the reason there are backups is when it takes a long time to get stuff off the port on the boat and out to the ocean, it backs up everything else behind. Also, poor infrastructure development, which we just heard about in the last lecture, it takes longer for the product for those containers and that break to get to the ports in the first place so you get an idea of what's going on. This is a breakdown. This is a breakdown of the overall congestion points, this little red circle you see on the bottleneck location. As I, I said, you see how, how combined it is, on how tight the congestion is over here on the coast, where our ports are not getting as much out as they should and could be. I'm not going to bother with this. So, the question is, what regulations are in place and what kind of funding mechanisms are available? What can the government do? What should we be doing? Now, the same kind of thing I said with, uh, with the inland waterways case. There's a kind of political way about it. There's lots of ideas what we can do. There's actual consensus that something must be done. Everyone will agree that, that more trade good, better economy is good, right? But what we're going to do about it is kind of a problem. To figure that out, we're going to kind of get through some of the regulations that, that govern this. It's like, this is not an exhaustive list we can One of the most important is the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, the ISTEA. What did we say intermodality was? What's that? Yes, but the, that's, that's, a, that's a quick definition of it. But the idea of intermodality that relates to trade and our water and ports, rails, all those sort of things, the idea that we never really have to touch the product. Now, I said before, you sell your ship into the harbor, you have guys that go in, they, uh, they move the cast of the beer off, they move back to freight lines or whatever else you have, right? Intermodality means that's not a very intermodal transport system. Intermodality means that all those things are combined, basically with giant freight boxes. No one ever touches the freight until it gets to its end point. It, they're just tag boxes of product that move from point A to point B as quickly as possible. So a rail car goes to the, the truck, like the 18-wheeler drives to the railroad. They don't, they don't take anything that's in the trailer off. They just move the trailer onto the railroad. The railroad car goes.
goes towards the port, the, 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 the cargo container is then moved on to an uh, inner port kind of system where it waits in the storage, and it's moved on to a boat, and it goes. And what's in it is what's in it. We don't think too much about this. You obviously we regulate what's in it. We, we do keep track, but you get the idea. Those aren't broken down as separate products. They're all combined to the destination. And that's the idea of intermodality. And that's what the ISTEA tried to do in 1991. Let's promote a stronger system of intermodalism. And by doing that, by creating a cost-sharing function, uh, a cost-sharing function, so that local levels can build through the infrastructure they needed to make intermodality a reality. Yeah, right. So that's what that one. Is. Now, related to security, this is the Maritime Transportation Security Act of 2002. So right after 9/11, one of the huge concerns that we had was that we were not particularly safe from terrorist attacks. And we needed a system in place, or at least a better system in place, to help prevent uh, terrorists from using our ports and weapons against the United States. Now, this is pretty cool. It was the first time we, first time, that's important, required vessels and port facilities to conduct vulnerability assessments to give an idea of what could go wrong, and also develop security plans. It sort of works like the TSA if you're flying, but for ports. It creates a, a consistent security infrastructure overall, and started to help the there's federal funds that are appropriated to do those sort of things. The Maritime Transportation Security Act of 2002 is started. The funding for all these things, or port upgrades in general, comes from three main areas. You will notice that none of those things say the federal government. Bond initiatives, which basically means that the public votes for taxes or increases in other areas to establish the bonds, to spend the money to do whatever. State appropriations, grants, and port revenues. That last one's the sticking point. Well, actually, they're all three. But the last, the last one's the sticking point. Port revenues. Basically, it's a tenant, uh, like a tenant owner sort of situation. The government, as I said, establishes the area where the ports will be. To be established where the ports will be, but uh, they're run by the state and local port, port authorities, and then the people who come through pay excise taxes. Again, they don't want to pay. They don't want to spend more money to send their products places. They want to be more competitive. They're not going to agree to spend more money on yet. For anything that has to do with port infrastructure. So unless it's security based, for the most part, the federal government doesn't directly doesn't directly provide. There's, there's no regulation that says you, you must oh, there are regulations that you have to be taken with. Not primarily federally funded. Tax incentives, loan guarantees, some federal grants are part of the funding mechanisms, but primarily it's done to the three things. One federal program that is kind of important, but woefully underfunded, and there will be affirmatives in this area, and as far as security asks go, this might be one that is topical, is the Port Security Grant Program. It's the only major federal funding for port security infrastructure. It comes in at about $150 million. So of the 300 or so ports, $150 million is enough money to fund upgrades, to fund modern security upgrades, which means GPS tech for the ships, more exact uh, scanning mechanisms, better ways to like actually see what the, we, we literally x-ray the boxes and things like that. So 300 ports, $150 million is gonna be about enough for us to make some, though not all necessary upgrades at about eight of the ports. So one half, I'm confident that you will hear the debate about whether it's security or transportation infrastructure will be forthcoming, but one half of the positive you're gonna hear is fully fund or expand the port security grant. I've said this already, the ports are maintained, funded, etc. Local, state, and private enterprise. Not a ton of federal support. Support, yes, yeah, funding. All right, I'm going to talk briefly about port security, and I'm going to talk briefly about it because my general thinking is that while there will be security related impacts and internal links, and certainly people will take a stab at it, I don't know that most most of the plans for port security, like the Coast Guard plans for monitoring or those sorts of things really are tough. Now, plans that do things that, that deal with the actual, uh, plans that deal with the, the security infrastructure itself, like building up the sort of like scanners we're talking about, or a more evolved GPS system for tagging and tracking ships like from their, port of, from their point of origin to the United States, etc. Like, now, those are questionably topical. But some of the things that were highlighted uh, in that maritime, in that Army War College maritime report, the more updated report, updated version were some of the, the concerns they had about what terrorists might do in our ports, and I thought this was kind of what we talking about. Commercial cargo containers smuggle in a WMD. So 
I basically put a nuclear bomb in a cargo container, ship it over on a boat, hope it makes it through our security system, and then blow it up. Now, all that stuff I said before about the importance of the force, obviously, a nuclear weapon, chemical and biological, any of those things, exploded into one of our ports would be absolutely devastating. Not only the human cost of that, which would be very, very high, but also the commercial cost of that would be enormous. Economically, a huge setback. Shutting down one of those ports makes all that congestion worse, all those things that kind of ripple throughout the entire system. Uh, Seizing a ship used as a 9-11 style weapon. Now we're not going to sail a ship into the World Trade Center. But, uh, <laughs> I don't think so. It's some sort of weird world where you have flying airships. No. But there was a concern, and listed in the report, was the concern that people would basically load the ship with a weapon, <coughs> crash it into a port, Speed 2 style. Yeah. I wish I could not find a good YouTube video of Speed 2. I'm going to have to watch it. Sand from bullets, fine too. Say that, but anyway, seize the ship, roll it in, blow it up, kind of crash it. So make the ship into a, a missile moving at 30 knots. <laughs> Sink a large car cargo ship to block traffic. So explode one in a bay is as, as a fairly reasonable concern. And actually, this was listed as the one that was most likely to happen. The easiest to do would be to sink the ship. Because you don't have to do it from on the ship. You basically take a dirty act, blow some explosives, crash it to the side of the ship, US coal style. You know? and the ship sinks, and we block things forever. Raising that ship, removing the cargo, the first, there's like this rescue, the rescue operation would be <coughs> then raising that ship, dismantling it, breaking it down, and getting it out of the way would take a long time. The report indicated that a one sunk ship in a tightly contained, a, 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 a tightly contained harbor, like, the, like Los Angeles Harbor, could stop trade out of there for about three weeks. That's a lot of work. Now, surely that's hyperbolic, but imagine if we had to get it out, it's still pretty scary. And attacking a large ship carrying a dangerous material, let's say an LNG freighter. Anybody read anything about what happens when LNG explodes and compressed LNG? Sir? Liquid natural gas. Now we know. Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, what it is? No, liquid <laughs> gas. Enormous explosion. Sub nuclear, but like the fuel air bomb, the lab kind of thing. The, the, the damage of it is huge. It to say to incinerate, say would incinerate things within like a 30 mile radius is uh, an understatement. Well, like big It's crazy. LNG tankers, LNG pipelines, are very long for terrorist are kind of concerned that might happen. Now I'm not gonna. That was sort of my quick overview of those things. I do have a neat little video. I hope it's about three minutes long. That sort of about this. And it shows you sort of what the. I like it also not because it's sort of about the security. They the come security. and go by the thousands each day. <laughs> Millions each year around New York City. Steel containers brought by ship from every corner of the world and hold the goods that help drive the world economy. But the head of the Department of Homeland Security's Domestic Nuclear Detection Office, Bail Oxford, knows the danger that can lurk behind each container door. We're working every day to deal with this problem. Those the problem facing Oxford cannot be seen by the naked eye, and it has no odor, radiological material that can